Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's very great to be here with all of you here in it's uh, with all of you student and maybe for the dean and the leader of uni uh, medical faculty University of Lampung who has attended this lecture this afternoon and thank you for the student from out out from from other faculty and then maybe we'll start our lecture second lecture integrated with our blog MBS2 maybe for the first to open this lecture excuse me for Prof Cheng our yes. dean has been here okay Prof Cheng have you do you hear me yes I can hear you thank you Prof Cheng can you hear my voice uh, yes I can hear your voice can you hear my voice okay okay Okay, Prof. Cheng, this is our dean and maybe for the first, we will open this lecture. We will give our dean to give the great things for this lecture. Please, Mr. Dia Hulan. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Tabik pun. Profesor Cheng Hui Ming. Tapi pun means permission to speak in Lampung language, and it is answered by ya pun, which means giving permission to speak. Okay. Ya pun. Okay. Uh, the honourable our speaker, Professor Cheng Hui Ming, Vice Dean of Faculty of Medicine, University of Lampung, Head of Study Programs in Faculty of Medicine, University of Lampung, lecturers, and all of the students who attend this integrated lecture, both offline and online. 
First, let us praise and be grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, without whose grace we would not be able to take a part in this integrated lecture. Please allow me to first express my gratitude to Professor Cheng Huiming, who will present lecture with the topic related to renal physiology, along with Head of Medical Study Program and all of students who have participated in this lecture. Today's lecture is part of integrated lecture in block of Medical Basic Science 2 of Medical Study Program, Faculty of Medicine, University of Lampung. And we hope that this lecture will give us a lot of information about medical science, especially renal physiology, as well as can contributes to the development of learning system in faculty of medicine, especially in medical study program. We also hope that this lecture can be a beginning for future cooperation between faculty of medicine, University of Lampung and faculty of medicine, University of Malay. Once again, thank you and we beg you for forgiveness for any flaws. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Mrs. Dean, Medical Faculty, University of Lampung, to opening this lecture session. Maybe we will continue with our lecture session. I hope the student who will trigger the room, the room will be ready. So maybe Prof Cheng, I give this turn to you. We, with an honor for Prof Cheng Huiming with Renal Physiology. Please, thank you, thank you, Dr. Prof. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nisa. Uh, is my voice? Can my voice be heard on your side? Yes, okay, it's clear, good. Prof. Right. Yeah, first of all, thank you, uh, Professor Dean, uh, for opening this uh, session with the students. And uh, thank you, Dr. Denisa, for arranging this session with your students. And uh, and I understand that there, there, may be, there may be some students from Malahayati who might be joining us. If they are, welcome uh, also to this session on uh, renal physiology. So I understand that uh, from the students that uh, that the renal block has been covered or almost completely covered. So which means that I will uh, be able to present this in a, in a way that assumes that you have already covered the details. And so within uh, about 60 minutes, I will give a big broad picture, uh, sometimes we use the word uh, bird's eye view of uh, renal physiology. And uh, and this morning, uh, sorry, this, this afternoon in Kuala Lumpur, uh, I am glad to be able to collaborate with some of the students uh, in Lampong who will come in at various points during my, my, my lecture before the main points to give a little short introduction. So about 13 to 14 students, uh, you will see them uh, coming in at various points and they will introduce uh, some aspect of renal physiology uh, before I elaborate. Yeah, so, so thank you again for this opportunity. So I will uh, start to share screen now. And uh, just for those students who are uh, listening, uh, uh, I would like to share this PowerPoint slide uh, through Dr. Nisa to all of you. So don't be too worried about trying to copy all the notes. Uh, I will, uh, you, you can have this set of PowerPoint slides. After the talk, I will send it to Dr. Nisa and uh, Dr. Nisa can share it with you. And so, so you can feel a bit more, more relaxed to, to just listen and hopefully 
uh, can enjoy some renal physiology together. Okay, so uh, so let's start with sh screen share. Okay, that's fine. Okay, uh, so my, my first slide here, you, you see a map uh, of, uh, I found this map of the Banda Lampong here, and then also part of Java uh, with Banteng here. So, and I, if I remember correctly, uh, there is a medical school called uh, University Sultan Ageng, Teruta Yasa, which is at the top here. So, uh, this is interesting because uh, this uh, university was where I gave a talk last week on the same topic, uh, renal physiology, homeostasis. And so the title of my talk at uh, Untitra in Banteng, I, I hope I got this correct, was uh, using a hopefully engaging title, and that is Henley and homeostasis. Henley obviously referring to the loop of Henley, okay? And then the subtitle is the YouTube. The loop of Henley is like a YouTube, right? Uh, so this is the YouTube of Kidney Land. Kidney Land sounds like, like Disneyland, okay? So we hope that we can explore together some of the interesting uh, physiology in, in renal mechanism, okay? So now we are crossing from Java, Banteng, uh, to Banda, Lampong, uh, to meet you all uh, virtually, and I hope I can meet you all uh, physically when after after COVID and after vaccine. Yeah, so yesterday I just got my first injection of uh, COVID, the first dose. So in three weeks' time, I will get the second dose, and hopefully, travel can resume between countries, and we can meet uh, face to face. So let's move on to the second slide. So here you are, Mr. Henley, yeah. So I like to tell students to try to enrich their learning of physiology. So every time you see somebody's name, like Henley or Starling, uh, try to look up, uh, to see what they look like and try to read about uh, their contribution to physiology, and you can even read about their background and their family, their, their educational background and so on. Okay, this will allow you to be uh, more, more complete in your education as you um, find out more about how the knowledge that we now have in textbook has come from some of these key individuals. Uh, we call them icons in uh, physiology. And today we are looking at renal physiology. So, uh, so the next picture is actually a, a picture, I think it was 2016 or 17, where I first met uh, Dr. Nisa, I think, and her students at the National Physiology Quiz in Ailanga. So I managed to find this picture. Dr. Nisa will recognize. And, and some of her students have recently graduated. Uh, and I think they are uh, doing their they yeah, probably internship or specialty now. So this is uh, Dr. Nisa here and uh, some of your seniors who uh, at that time they were probably second year students, but now uh, 2017, so four years ago. So they were second year students, I think. So this was at the national competition. And then, uh, so next slide is uh, just my own uh, personal information. So what I, always try to do is try to uh, welcome students to continue to uh, interact with me if they if they feel free so that we can uh, discuss physiology even after this session okay so this is the near my department of physiology so we also have a very green campus so now back to the concept of renal physiology and how the kidney is involved in the homeostasis of the body fluid and specifically uh, the kidney is involved in the homeostasis of the extra cellular fluid so this picture shows you done by one of my friends who is a calligrapher as well as artist so you see the keyword homeostasis 
and you see some of the associated uh, keywords when we think about this control mechanism. So you have control, or sometimes we use the word regulate, and then obviously we are interested in maintaining the balance of uh, several parameters in the extracellular fluid. And we have the word maintain, and obviously in the homostatic loop, there is the importance of uh, negative feedback so that there can be compensation and restoration should some of the parameters uh, fluctuates. Okay, So homeostasis uh, is a key word when we think about how the kidney is involved in maintaining the balance of various parameters in the body, in the body fluid, the extracellular fluid. Uh, the next slide, I want to introduce another person, uh, and that is the, the person who coined the word homeostasis. Okay, so, and this is the person, uh, Walter Cannon. Okay, Walter Cannon is the one who um, developed the concept of homo homeostasis that actually evolved from another physiologist called Claude Bernard. Okay, I don't have the picture of Claude Bernard here. Uh, but this is the American physiologist that gave you the word homeostasis. And he is the one that also uh, gave you the, the phrase fight or flight reaction, describing the autonomic sympathetic system. So this is a classic book that was written by Walter Cannon called The Wisdom of the Body. In other words, uh, describing the human body that is uh, designed and capable of discerning and responding to various changes in the body. Okay, the wisdom and design of the human body. Okay, so um, so at this point, uh, some of your classmates will come and introduce uh, the first point that I want to make, and that is the kidney is not merely for excretion. Okay, so although it is for excretion, but it is not merely for excretion. So I think you recognize some of your classmates. So this is Ahmad and Dafa, and I like to welcome them to introduce uh, uh, the first point about the role of the kidney in homeostatic physiology. So let me stop sharing and ask them to take over. Ahmad and Dafa, the, the floor is yours. Can we study together? I haven't finished studying yet. In fact, studying together sounds amazing. All right, cool. So, where should we start? Do um, you know that kidneys are not only as great as they are? What? Cool? Yeah, and besides which function for the great in the system, kidneys also maintain the water balance. It means the osmolarity of fatty fluids, plus ionic concentration in the region and the tract. Wow, so cool! How about um, homeostasis? Is there any relation between homeostasis and kidney? Very good question. Of course, yes. The kidneys regulate the stress in the food body by maintaining salt and liquid balance, by adjusting the output of salt and water in form of urine as needed to compensate to intake and the loss of water and salt. Wow, so good. You know, there is one cool function. Mm -hmm. Wait, what? Tell us another function? Yeah. Kidney is also controlled, regulated, and maintain a value of parameters in the extracellular fluid. Wow, that's so amazing. Thanks for the information, Rafa. You're welcome. Thanks, too. 
Okay, thank you, uh, Dafa and Ahmad. The, uh, there's a, the, the sound system is a little bit fragmented, but I think you can see the words and uh, the main points that they were making. Uh, and that the kidneys are not just for excretion. Uh, besides excretion, it is performing many other physiological function. And so let me uh, go back to my slide. And uh, so we are here. Okay, so, okay, let's continue. Uh, uh, following on from what Ahmad and Dafa is saying. So here I call our kidneys, our wonderful kids, okay? Wow, we. So we'll be, we will be talking about the control of water balance, which is something also associated with osmolarity. Okay, osmoregulation, is maintaining water balance. And then we will be talking about the control of ECF volume. And that is related to something called maintaining total body sodium because to total body sodium affects the volume of ECF. Okay, so sodium balance. And at the end of this talk, we will be talking about the importance of the kidney in acid-base balance. Okay, and then we will also be talking about the control of potassium balance, homeostasis of potassium concentration by the kidney. Okay, and obviously, I think all of us know quite well that the kidney will absorb all the essential solutes uh, like glucose and amino acid. So, uh, so this will be what we will be covering uh, one at a time, water balance, sodium balance, potassium balance, and then pH acid-base balance throughout the course of this talk, okay, this uh, bird's eye view talk. So, uh, so the point that we are making today, uh, main point is that when you go to the washroom, you are not just producing urine volume, you are not just producing, uh, getting rid of, ex, uh, of metabolic products because uh, going to the washroom, uh, if you can imagine that every time you go to the washroom, you are performing homeostatic work because the amount of urine you produce and the amount of sodium or potassium or protons, uh, acid that you uh, excrete in the urine depends on the changes in the extracellular fluid. Okay. So, uh, so next slide is from one, uh, is one of my favorite cartoon character. So this is my tagline uh, that peeing, uh, going to the washroom is a physiologic homeostatic event. So to introduce uh, the first major control, that is the control of water balance, I'd like to uh, now invite another three of your classmates who will tell us something about uh, water balance. And this is uh, Gatra, uh, Alfie and Brian. Uh, will tell us something about the kidney's role in maintaining water balance, which is linked to osmo regulation. Okay, right. Katra, Elfie, Brian, the show is yours. Okay, Prof. Thank you for uh, the opportunity, Prof. So, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Prof. Cheng, Dr. Nisa, and my beloved friends. Good to see you all today, and I hope you all good today. Before we start, let me introduce ourselves. My name is Gatra Handimuti Wibowo. My name is Brian Arya Rafif Nasution. Uh, my name is Muhammad Salman Al Farisi. So in this presentation, we will discuss about the kidney function of water balance. How the kidneys play a role in the body. The kidneys have 
uh, essential role in water balance. For example, when you are dehydrated or in negative water balance, the kidneys will reabsorb more water to balance the fluids in our bodies. When the body is dehydrated, the concentration of uh, antidiuretic hormone in the blood increase. This is turn cause and an increase in the amount of filtered water that is reabsorbed in the late distal tubule and collecting duct. Depending on how much the blood antidiuretic hormone level in increase, the amount of filtered water that is reabsorbed in the late tubule and collecting duct can increase from just above 19% uh, to as high as 19.8%. As a result, less than 1% of filtered water remains re unreabsorbed in the late distal tubule and collecting duct which corresponds to uh, urine output below the normal 1.5 until 2 liter per day. Okay, then the second question is how the kidneys work when the body is overhydrated. Uh, okay, I would like to explain you guys about the definition of overhydration first. Overhydration is a condition that occurs from drinking too much water, upsetting electrolyte balance. It means that the body takes in more water than it lost. As opposed to overhydration, this dehydration is a condition where less fluid that comes out more than the amount of fluid that comes in. Uh, and then the overhydration. Next slide, Dr. And then the overhydration causes several symptoms such as difficulty of breathing, edema, and the increase of jugular venous pressure. So this means that when you are overhydrated or in positive water balance, the kidneys will extract a larger volume of urine. Then when the urine is full, the bladder will send a signal to the brain to reverse the situation. The bladder muscle contract while the sphincter relax, allowing the urine to pass. Then number three will be continued to my friend, Alfie. Okay, so the next question is, what is the relation between kidney's role and osmoregulation? So the relation between kidney's role and osmoregulation is the kidney have a role to control water balance in our bodies with the osmoregulation. Osmoregulation is the process of regulating fluid concentration and balancing the intake and excretion of body fluids by living cell or organism. So there is the importance of osmoregulation. There is hypertonic, isotonic, and hypotonic. The first one is hypertonic solution. It's the condition when the solution outside of the cell is more concentrated than the inside of the cell. Water will move out of the cell by osmosis, causing it to shrink. Second one is isotonic solution. The solution inside the cell has the same concentration as the outside of the cell, which will move in and out of the cell at an equal rate. And the last one is hypotonic solution. The solution outside of the cell has a lower concentration than the, than the inside of the cell, which will move into the cell by osmosis, sometimes causing it to burst. So thank you for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Gatra, Alfie, Brian, uh, for that presentation. So I will pick up some of the points uh, mentioned by the three students, and we will uh, look at some more details about water balance controlled by the kidney and its relation to osmoregulation. So in the last slide, in, uh, in the last slide presented by the students, uh, the, it mentions that the extracellular fluid osmolarity can change in different ways. It can increase, so your ECF becomes hypertonic, or it can decrease and your ECF becomes hypotonic. Uh, this may not mean anything, but just give you an example. If you retain excessive water and your ECF, extracellular fluid, becomes hypotonic, then water will enter the cells. And the most important consequence is that in the neurons, water that enters a cell when your ECF becomes hypertonic will begin to expand the neurons. And so you get neuronal swelling. 
and which is actually uh, quite serious because when the neurons swell, it, it does not mean you have a bigger brain. It, it actually means that it will interfere with all the neuronal function. Okay, so controlling osmolarity, that's why it's very important. And this is linked to the control of water balance. So we will look at this in more detail now. So let me share screen again. Uh, so we go back to... Okay, so as you might have heard uh, in the presentation by the three students, that the GFR uh, is actually a very large value. Uh, some of you may memorize this as one to five mil per minute. Uh, this may not mean very much. This, this is the total fluid that is filtered by all the two million nephrons in both kidneys. But if you convert this value to per day, this is uh, 180 liters per day. This is a normal GFR, which is a huge value because uh, one bottle of Coca-Cola is 1.25 liters. So this is many, many times uh, this huge volume that is filtered by the kidney. Now, if you remember your body fluid lecture, in a 70 kilogram male adult, which has uh, an ECF of about 14 liters, total body water will be 42. This means that more than 10 times of the total extracellular fluid volume is filtered and processed by the kidney. So obviously, this tells you something very important in the regulation of GFR, glomerular filtration rate, which is the first step in urine formation. So, and if you have heard uh, one of the students mention that what comes out in the toilet, uh, the urine output is actually a very small percentage. It's only one to two liters, which means that the when you think about the kidney's ability to reabsorb and recycle, most of this water is very large. Okay, 180 liters produced per day and about two liters is excreted, which means that 178 liters of water is reabsorbed by your two kidneys per day. This is a maximum, this is a huge capacity for the tubular reabsorption of water. So uh, as we said, that the amount of urine you produce is in response to changes in the water balance. Okay, if you are in Negative, sorry, let me just expand this. Okay, uh, sorry. Okay, if you are in negative water balance, it means you are dehydrated. Uh, it means that your osmolarity has increased in the ECF. And so what will happen naturally is that you will produce less urine volume. So we should, here again, we are saying that the body is responding to changes in your, in your water balance by excreting either more or less water. Okay, if you are in negative water balance, your osmolarity in the ECF is higher. And so the ADH mechanism will be activated because your hypothalamic osmoreceptors senses the hypoosmolarity. And so you can conserve more water and excrete less urine volume. Now the ability of the kidney to do this is I think uh, all of you know this by now, since you've covered most of renal physiology, is due to a mechanism called the renal countercurrent mechanism. This is obviously an interesting and complex mechanism, but just to review here, the renal countercurrent mechanism is a function of a subpopulation of nephrons. About 15% of your nephrons are called juxta medullary nephrons, meaning that the glomerulus uh, and the Bowman capsule of these nephrons, juxta medullary nephrons, are located very close to a juxta to the medullary area. Okay, Most of the other 85% nephrons have the glomerulus in the cortex. So you call them cortical nephrons. Okay, So the long loop of the juxta medullary nephrons together with the long loop of the capillary that supplies this Henley's long loop 
uh, called the Basa Rekta together creates and also sustain a high region of osmolarity. Okay. And this is important because water will only move when there is an osmotic gradient. So the function of ADH is obviously to make the collecting duct permeable to water. But if you have ADH alone and this part becomes permeable to water, water will not move unless there is a region of high osmolarity. And that region of high osmolarity is set up and prepared by the counter current mechanism that involves the long nephron U-tube of Henley and the long basa recta capillary that supplies this uh, little Henley. I think, okay. So this is just to remind you that you need two things in order to conserve water. You need ADH to make the collecting duct permeable and you also need the high osmo osmotic interstitium in order for water to move when the collecting duct becomes permeable to water. So the next two, next, next two slides is just to show you uh, the mechanisms you already know. Uh, sorry, so this is the uh, hypoosmotic interstitium uh, that you recognize. Uh, we call this osmotic stratification. It's like strata increasing osmolarity. And so this region is created by the renal countercurrent mechanism. Okay, so uh, so so this is an example of the response of the body. In this case, this is to positive water balance when you are overhydrated. Okay, so if you are a vol volunteer for an experiment, uh, you drink a lot of water, you're in positive water balance, and immediately your osmolarity will decrease. You have diluted the extra cellular fluid, and so the Osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus senses the positive water balance or senses the low osmolarity. The response is less ADH, also called vasopressin release. And so in this case of positive water balance, the collecting duct remains impermeable to water and most of the filtrate that arrives at the collecting duct is just excreted. And so your urine volume in this case where there is positive water balance will be larger and the osmolarity of the urine will be less. Okay, So this is the response of the body. Now, um, the next slide is just to show you, uh, to remind you that the ADH mechanism is also affected by volume changes. Okay, So decrease in plasma volume can also be another stimulus besides changes in osmolarity that will uh, increase or decrease ADH. So if you have hypovolemia, okay, uh, this will increase vasopressin also from the posterior pituitary. You can also get uh, increased permeability and conservation of water. Okay, so the volume sensors uh, includes actually uh, the barrel receptors because barrel receptors are mechanical receptors. Uh, you can call them volume sensors because as the blood volume changes, the blood pressure also changes. Okay? And you also have the volume sensors in the venous side of the circulation as well as in the uh, chambers of the heart. Okay? So all this can feed back into the vasopressin or ADH mechanism. So the next slide is just to uh, integrate the other important mechanism that monitors and responds to water balance or osmoregulation, and that is the sensation of thirst. The sensation of thirst is also regulated by neurons in the hypothalamus. Although we associate uh, thirst with a dry mouth, but there are neurons in the hypothalamus that also responds to uh, changes in osmolarity. So this is an integrated slide. So just look at it carefully uh, in your own leisure, uh, information that you have really learned, thirst mechanism and ADH mechanism, and two major stimulus changes in os osmolarity and changes in volume can both affect thirst as well as ADH mechanism.
Okay, so basically this is a summary of how the body responds to changes in water balance. Okay, so it responds to changes in water balance uh, by responding to changes in the osmolarity. Okay, now I'm going to mention something uh, in a short while and that is when the osmoreceptors respond to changes in osmolarity, it is actually responding also to changes in sodium concentration. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to mention in a short while that the that the osmoreceptors that detect changes in sodium concentration is a separate mechanism from what we're going to hear in a short while about the kidney's response to sodium balance. Sodium balance means total body sodium. This is different from uh, sodium concentration. Okay, I'll explain this in a short while. So uh, the next part of my talk, I would like to invite uh, three more of your classmates. You will recognize them and they will be introducing the topic of the kidney's role in sodium physiology and specifically in the control of total body sodium, something we call a uh, sodium balance. Okay. So let me invite uh, Ganesha, Yoga, and Rafa, who will tell us something about sodium balance. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Prof. Cheng, Dr. Nisa, professors and doctors. I hope you all are still in a high spirit as I am in following this lecture. First of all, thank you so much, Prof. Cheng, for the opportunity to participate in this guest lecture. Hello, everyone. My name is Rafa, alongside with my partners, Ganesha and Yoga. We'll present the introduction about the relation of kidney and sodium balance. So, Yoga, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, Rafa. Permit me to introduce myself first. My name is Nanga Yoga Permana. Uh, okay, the role of kidney are essential in sodium balance. In which sodium is um, of the body electrolytes, which also in the most abundant solid in extra solid fluid. Uh, so, why does kidney play a big role in sodium balance? Okay, so as we can see that this guy is extremely sweating and how can we correlate the sweating in the kidney function? So sweating and donating blood will cause a negative insulin balance because the sweating, when we're sweating, the sodium are go out, dissolved with the blood and the sweat and it will turn out altering our kidney function. Okay, so since sodium balance will also affect our blood volume and around cells, this will also indicate that the control of sodium balance will also link to the control of blood pressure by the kidney. Our body will continually monitor blood volume and sodium concentration. So what will happen to our body when our blood volume and sodium concentration increase or decrease? When either the sodium concentration or the blood volume increase or become too high, the sensors in the heart, blood vessels, and kidney will detect the increase and stimulate the kidney to increase the sodium excretion so that it will return the blood volume to normal state. On the other hand, when blood volume or sodium concentration becomes too low, the sensors will trigger mechanism such as stimulating the secretion of hormone to increase blood volume so that it will return to, blood, to normal blood volume state. So that's all from us. Thank you so much everyone for the attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, uh, Ganesha, Yoga, and Rafa for that uh, brief introduction to the importance of sodium physiology, sodium balance. So now I'm going to uh, talk a bit more detail about the kidney's role in maintaining 
total body sodium, also called sodium balance, and how, as you heard uh, the students uh, highlight, that this is linked to controlling blood volume and blood pressure. Okay, As I mentioned uh, in, uh, in a short while ago, the control of sodium concentration is actually different from the control of sodium balance. Control of sodium concentration is related to osmoregulation because sodium concentration is the most important determinant of osmolarity. Okay, As you drink a lot of water, your osmolarity decreases, your sodium concentration also decreases. Okay, So let me make this point by showing you just uh, a few slides. Uh, first one is one of my favorite cartoon series. And uh, in this series, there is some physiology not, not normally seen. And this is the, sorry, let me just show share screen again. I forgot about that. Okay, I mean, let me open this up. Okay, so here we are. Oh, here you are. So this is a peanut cartoon and uh, you can see, you can read it for yourself. And here it says, a case of hypo, Natremia. This is uh, sodium, a, a decrease in sodium concentration, and then he goes and give a little bit of water. So uh, now I leave it to you to think about whether uh, the physiology here is correct. Okay, uh, but this is for fun to show you that uh, this is sodium concentration. Okay, sodium concentration. Now just to make the point that sodium concentration is linked to sodium uh, to, to water balance. I will show you the next slide. This is a triangle, uh, and I'll explain what we mean by the triangle. Okay. Okay. So this is a triangle showing you osmolarity or osmoregulation. Uh, water here is water balance, and sodium in the box here is sodium concentration. Okay. So this is my recent way of trying to organize small pieces of information into a visual and mental image using uh, geometry so that hopefully students can remember this better. So we call this a combination of physiology and geometry. So we call this fee, fee geometry, fee geometric diagram. So the main point here is that these three parameters, osmolarity, osmoregulation, control of water balance, and the control of sodium concentration actually functionally means the same thing. So let me repeat myself by giving the example. If you are in positive water balance, your osmolarity will decrease and so will your sodium concentration. On the other hand, if you are dehydrated, you are in negative water balance, it means that you are hyper osmotic, you are also hyper natremic. Okay? So these three parameters means the same thing. They are controlled and regulated by the osmoreceptors ADH mechanism. So that's why you have this three in one coffee here. The three parameters actually are re referring to the same functional uh, mechanism involving the osmoreceptor ADH mechanism. Now the next slide is a bit uh, complex. Uh, this is where you can read it slowly when you get the PowerPoint slide. It's just to give examples to to emphasize that the sodium balance and the sodium concentration changes are not related. Okay, I'm going to just show you the slide now. Uh, here we are. Okay, this was a slide um, given uh, to the medical students in the University of Colombo. And the title of that presentation was CAT in the balance. Now, why, why CAT? Because sodium is a CAT ion. That's why we, we use the word CAT, okay? So this was the title of the talk, and uh, in one of the slides, this was the emphasis, the sodium concentration is not the same as sodium balance, okay? So it is, uh, this is just a pun, it's sodium, sodium essential to differentiate and not lose balance. So just give one example, uh, the example that I just mentioned, if you drink a lot of water, you can be hyponatremic, obviously, you've diluted the ECF, but your total body sodium is still unchanged. Okay, so if you drink water, you are hyponatremic, but you have unchanged sodium balance. 
and there are other examples here. Uh, so in this case, if you sweat a lot, you are dehydrated, uh, you are hypernatremic because you're dehydrated. Uh, but at the same time, since sodium is lost in your sweat, you are in negative sodium balance. So you can have high sodium concentration and low sodium balance. Okay, So the two things are not the same. So I'm going to just leave it here. And uh, as I said, welcome you to uh, ask further questions. You can contact me. Let me move on. So the next slide is uh, just to highlight that you can be hyponatremic without losing any sodium, right? You just drink water here, okay? You become hyponatremic, but the total body sodium has remained unchanged, okay? So in recent, uh, in, in, in recent uh, months, I have uh, asked one of my uh, students to, to char characterize in the character so we have come up with a character of a Japanese um, female medical student. And this character is called Miss Take. Miss Take. Uh, Miss Take sounds like the word for mistake, right? Miss Take. Uh, so basically, we are trying to compile a series of statements that will be made by Miss Take to emphasize some of the common misconceptions that students make. Okay, so this is uh, one example. Here you are, Miss Take. Is saying that you don't need to lose sodium to become hyponatremic. Let me go back to here. There you are. Here you are hyponatremic. You just drink a lot of water. You don't need to lose sodium to become hyponatremic. In this case, you just need to drink a lot of water. So, um, okay. So this is an article uh, in response to my own observation among my own students in University of Malaya and also in my interaction with uh, students overseas, that this is a common uh, misconception about the control of sodium balance and sodium concentration. So I wrote this together with my head of department uh, about students lose balance. We are now, we are here interested this afternoon in balance, homeostasis. Students lose balance over the yin yang using the word from Chinese physiology of sodium physiology. Now, this article, I'm happy to share with students uh, also. So please contact me if you're interested. I will send you the article by WhatsApp and you can read it on your own. Okay. So uh, this involves obviously many information that you would have already heard in your renal lectures. Okay. But putting it together so that uh, the difference uh, between sodium balance control and sodium concentration control can be more clearly distinguished. So let's move on to what we actually mean when we say the kidney is able to respond to uh, changes in sodium balance. Okay? So this is uh, perhaps one of the most important concepts in renal physiology. So the ECF volume, the extracellular fluid volume is linked to total body sodium. So whenever the volume changes, the response of the kidney is always to change the amount of sodium that you excrete in the kidney in order to compensate. So changes in ECF volume is compensated. You can add the word even here. It's always compensated by changes in urinary sodium excretion. So if you are in total if you are in positive sodium balance, your ECF volume will increase. If you lose ECF volume, you are in negative sodium balance. And so if you need to excrete less sodium, let's look at the renal handling relationship here. Excreted sodium is equal to filtered minus reabsorbed. If you need to excrete less sodium in order to respond to negative sodium balance, it always means that the filtered sodium will be less and the reabsorbed sodium will be more in order to reduce the excreted sodium. I think you've done this in your renal classes, isn't it? So, uh, so and one of the most important function of the hormone aldosterone is to respond 
to negative sodium balance. Okay, and this is the factor. Sodium, sorry, aldosterone always increases the reabsorbed sodium. Okay, so I just to remind you, uh, next picture shows you that the hormonal activation of increased sodium reabsorption by aldosterone when you are in negative sodium balance happens at the collecting duct. Okay, at the principal cells of the collecting duct uh, where this happens. Okay, so here we are. So I think you recognize this. This is the paratubular capillary this side. This is the luminal fluid, sorry, the tubular fluid. So reabsorption of sodium obviously occurs from the tubular fluid across the first membrane and then across the second membrane by this energy requiring sodium ATP is pumped. So the hormone aldosterone increases both the ATPase activity that will pump sodium out and also increases the number of sodium channels in the luminal membrane. And so the overall two steps of sodium reabsorption is stimulated by aldosterone. Okay. Now to just to remind you how interesting and complex uh, this response to negative sodium balance is, is that the aldosterone that stimulates this is derived from a family of other hormones origi originating from the a hormone, which is an enzyme from the kidney called renin. And I think all of you will know about the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Okay, So just to review, whenever you are in negative sodium balance or when you lose body fluid, renin will be secreted and renin will eventually lead to increase aldosterone. Okay, so let me summarize this by showing you this slide. This is quite complex slide, uh, but I just want to highlight. Uh, so let's start at the top here, decrease plasma volume. So think about it from the point of sodium balance. Every time you decrease volume, you are in negative sodium balance. Okay, and what will happen in the kidney? Look at what happens right at the end. Every time you are in negative sodium balance, a decreased volume, you will always excrete less sodium. This is the response of the kidney. In other words, the amount of sodium that you excrete in the urine is not just excretion. It is a response, homeostatic response to changes in the volume of your body fluid or changes in a sodium balance. And so if you want to reduce sodium excretion, there you are, you have increased aldosterone. And aldosterone, as we said, comes from angiotensin 2 and the angiotensin 2 was derived by the chemical reaction of renin. Now this here shows you the three pathways whereby every time the volume drops, it will always stimulate renin. One is, uh, just to remind you, is the renal sympathetic nerve. Okay, the renal sympathetic nerve innervates the JG cells that will release renin. Okay, so every time your volume decreases, there is a barrel reflex because your pressure drops, it activates the renal sympathetic nerves and it, it activates the sympathetic system, which includes the renal sympathetic nerve and that releases a renin. The second mechanism is that as your volume drops, there is a fairly complex mechanism whereby eventually the macula densa, MACD is not McDonald, eh? the macula densa will send a signal to also increase renin. This happens at the same time the renal sympathetic nerve increases renin. The signal uh, by the macula densa will also stimulate renin. Then the third mechanism involves a changes in the renal perfusion pressure or renal arterial pressure. Okay, as your volume drops, your pressure drops, and at it says a direct effect of less stretch. This is uh, sensing by the volume sensors at the efferent arterial, your efferent arterial. Now these volume sensors are also given a name, which I think you might already know, called the intrarenal, is found in the kidney at the efferent arterial, the intrarenal barrel receptors. 
that directly senses the drop in the renal perfusion pressure or the renal arterial pressure. And so at the same time, renal sympathetic nerve increases renin, signal from macula densa also increases renin. You also get this direct sensing and also an increased renin. So a very beautiful coordinated response of three different mechanisms to increase renin so that renin will produce aldosterone in order to reduce sodium excretion. Yeah. So we are summarizing a lot of information here that we normally explain in more detail, uh, perhaps in about 45 minutes. So, so let me just uh, uh, give you a slogan. Uh, this was inspired by our Corona COVID virus in terms of renal physiology. I hope you appreciate this slogan related to this response to sodium balance, negative sodium balance, and positive sodium balance. So this is a slogan. Kidneys are salinizers and sodium distances. So this sounds like sanitizers and uh, social distancing, right? So here we are, you see, uh, if you are in negative sodium balance, the kidney will always absorb more sodium. And this is always followed by chloride. So if you are in positive sodium balance, the kidney will always excrete more sodium in the kidney. Okay, so this is uh, now, uh, then the next one, which might interest you, I don't know whether I've already shared this. And this is a song written some time ago based on a popular Malaysian Indonesian uh, folk song uh, that uses uh, physiology lyrics related to sodium balance. So here you are, uh, sodium related to volume. And this is the uh, aldosterone from renin angiotensin pathway. So do you recognize this song? Uh, this song is sung in Malaysia and also in Indonesia. Yeah, so you can sing this later. Yeah, this is Rasa Sayang. Okay, Rasa Sayang. So you can sing this to Rasa Sayang. Okay, so let me... Um, okay, so this is the uh, my last slide for sodium balance before we move on to the homeostasis of potassium balance. So I want to give you an example to illustrate water balance, which we have done, and sodium balance, which we just did. Okay, So in sweating, you, uh, you can delete the severe here. You don't have to have severe sweating. You will lose, obviously, sweat. Sweat is always a hypotonic fluid. Okay, And when you lose sweat, you are in negative water balance, which is obvious, obviously. Now your osmolarity will increase. And then you can write here, your sodium concentration will increase. You are hypernatremic. Okay? And so the response here is obviously osmoregulation involving ADH. On this side, once you lose body fluid, you also lose sodium. You are in negative sodium balance. And so here we have what we've just discussed. Uh, it involves a reduction in GFR so that the amount of sodium you filtered will be less. It also involves what we've been talking about, an increase in aldosterone, so that you will conserve more sodium in order to respond to the negative sodium balance. Whenever you lose uh, body fluid, in this case, in the form of uh, hypotonic sweat. Okay. So, uh, so the next part is uh, we want to look at the kidney's role in another cation. Uh, control and that is potassium concentration. So I'm very happy to uh, introduce another uh, three of your classmates. You recognize them. And this is Rafi, uh, Rizky and Shabila. Please uh, introduce uh, to all of us something about uh, the kidney's role in potassium balance. Okay. Okay, good, good afternoon, Prof. Cheng, Dr. Nisa, and all of my friends. Allow us to introduce ourselves. My name is Ahmad Rizky Farhan. And my name is Rafi Gutra Aslam. And my name is Shabila Febiliana Shafa. Okay, in this occasion, we would like to give you a quick overview about kidneys and potassium balance. Have a great review.
So my question is, what is potassium and potassium balance? Alright Rizky, I would like to explain to you about potassium and the potassium balance. Well, potassium is a mineral that controls nerve and muscle functions. Our hearts also beat at a normal rhythm because of potassium. While potassium balance is a regulation of the potassium cations in extracellular and intracellular used to maintaining fluid and electrolyte balance and pH levels of our bodies. But do you guys know what the correlations between kidney and potassium is? Thank you Sabila for the opportunity. Let me answer it. So most of food that we consume contain potassium. Of course, almost all food that we consume have it. So, when we eat, the level of potassium in the body become higher. Kidney remove excess potassium in the urine to help maintain normal level in the blood. So, it will be maintain the sodium and potassium balance in the blood or in the body. So, when the kidney fail, they can no longer remove excess potassium, so the level build up in the body. When kidney fail, it will be lost the ability to excrete, especially in potassium. So, the next question is, I wanted to give you a question about what influence the secretion of potassium cation. Thank you, I hope one of you can answer it. So, let me answer your question. There are three things that influence the secretion of potassium cation. The first one is the potassium cation concentration in ECF. The higher the concentration of potassium cation in ECF, the higher potassium cation that urine has to excrete. The second one, the pH change. When the pH of ECF falls, the ability of tubular fluid potassium cation secretion is decreased. It substitutes by the excretion of hydrogen to regulate the acid-base homeostatic. The third one is aldosterone level. The aldosterone level influences the peritubular fluid to absorb sodium and excrete potassium. Aldosterone level is influenced by ang angiotensin 2. This hormone increases the excretion of potassium concentration in the urine system. Next, my question is, how to maintain the potassium level stays normal? Alright, so here are some simple things that we can do to maintaining the potassium levels in our bodies. First, consume enough potassium. Enough means not too high and not too low. Secondly, limit foods that contain too high potassium. Third, try to pay attention to the meal size that we're going to consume. Fourth, avoid salt substitutes and other seasoning with potassium. Then, avoid eating canned fruits or canned vegetables, and if it happens, discard the liquids that comes in it. And lastly, if you have dialysis, do not skip it or ever shorten the treatment times. Okay, so that's all the introducing of potassium balance in urinary system. If any of you would like to search any further information, you can check to the my favorite book called Fundamental of Anatomy and Physiology by Martini, Ned, and Bertram Lemieux in 2012. And I am as the representation of this group. Say thank you so much for the opportunity and thank you so much for the attention, Professor, Doctor, and all of my friends. Thank you. Uh... Rafi, Rizky, and Jabila for that uh, introduction. So let me continue here uh, to elaborate a little bit more on uh, potassium physiology by the kidney. Okay, so, uh, so this is uh, again to remind you uh, the concept of renal handling. And so for sodium, we've just seen that this is excreted sodium is uh, filtered minus reabsorbed. Now for the renal handling of potassium, the important component is the tubular secretion here. Okay, it is filtered, it's reabsorbed, but the major control to maintain normal potassium balance is by secretion. And this is because the normal potassium concentration is very low. Sodium is quite high, 140 uh, concentration, but for, for potassium, it is very low. It's only four to five. And so you can imagine that it is very important to maintain the potassium concentration at that very low level. So fluctuation in potassium concentration can significantly increase 
the amount of potassium. And I think you know that the extracellular potassium affects both the nerve and muscle function. So obviously that is very important. Now, just to give you an overview of uh, potassium physiology, next slide, is just to highlight that uh, on the left here is that most of your potassium is inside the cell, okay? These are just random numbers to show you that the major bulk is in the cell and uh, the four to five millimole per liter in the extracellular fluid, uh, the total amount is much less. But this is the concentration that affects your function of your excitable tissue, the nerve and the muscle. And so it is very important to maintain this at this low concentration. So on a normal diet, as you would have heard from the students, you are always adding in excess potassium to the body. So you can imagine that immediately after a meal, the changes to the low sodium can concentration can be very significant. And so there are many events that will happen soon after a meal uh, in order to maintain normal low potassium concentration. And that includes even insulin. Insulin not only increases glucose uptake in the cell, it also increases potassium uptake in the cell. Okay? Now I want to just give you an overall picture. On an average of about 100 millimole of potassium per day, some is lost in the feces, uh, most of it is reabsorbed. But look at what happens in the urine. Okay, most of your excess potassium is excreted in the urine. So this highlights that the major homeostatic control for potassium concentration balance is actually the amount of potassium that you secrete and excrete in the urine. Okay, so as uh, the last uh, one of the slide by the student mentioned, every time you have renal problem, there is a danger of excess potassium accumulating in the blood. There's a serious problem of hyperkalemia in renal problem because the kidney is the only place where you can sufficiently uh, and hormonally secrete and excrete excess potassium. Okay, So uh, the general scheme, I think you already know, and this is uh, taken from vendors, physiology texts where it always had this very nice pastel color flow diagram. So imagine that there is increased potassium intake and this happens after every meal. Your potassium concentration will increase and immediately, very rapidly, in order to maintain the low potassium concentration, there is an increased aldosterone secretion. Aldosterone then circulates and arrives at the nephron, the collecting duct, and at the collecting duct, also acts on the same cell, the, princ the principal cell of the clotting duct, and it increases potassium secretion. Okay, so aldosterone has a double role in increasing sodium reabsorption and also increases potassium secretion at the same principal cell of the clotting duct, and so you get increased potassium excretion. Now, I want to leave you with one question to think about uh, for for all the students here in that in any homeostatic loop, you must have a sensor, and obviously this is the responder, uh, the hormone aldosterone. So changes in potassium concentration must be monitored by potassium sensors, or potassium, you can call them potassium concentration receptors. For example, changes in osmolarity are ch detected by osmoreceptors found in the hypothalamus. So my question for all of you is, where do you think the potassium concentration sensors or detectors are located in the body? Okay, you can try to search in textbook. You may even try to Google and uh, you can let me know where the potassium sensors are located. That is part of this homeostatic mechanism. So I'm going to just finish with one uh, restaurant slide just to highlight the importance of the secretion or by the kidney to respond to changes in potassium. So this is, uh, sorry, oh sorry. So this is a restaurant in my hometown. Uh, it says very okay restaurant. So when I saw this 
restaurant, the K here reminds me of potassium, very okay. Because every time you eat, you are adding in excess potassium to the body. And the body has a very rapid way in which it can respond to postprandial after a meal, hyperkalemia, by insulin, and obviously by aldosterone in order to secrete and excrete the excess potassium so that you don't become hyperkalemic and that will affect your heart function as well as your neuronal function. Okay. So the last part of my talk before I uh, say a little bit is the importance of the kidney, not only in water balance, sodium balance, potassium balance, but also in the critical role of maintaining the pH of the extracellular fluid or the pH of the blood. So this is the pH balance by uh, renal function. And uh, I'd like to welcome uh, three of your classmates, uh, last three of your classmates, uh, Rajansa, Asmi, and Zeba. Uh, please tell us something about acid base, base balance by the kidney. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, good afternoon, Prof Professor Cheng, Dr. Khairunisa, all the professors, all the doctors, and also all of my, uh, all of our beloved friends. Uh, we are from the last group. Uh, we are called last but not least because the topic that we are going to explain is just as important as the others. So we hope that you guys still has the spirit of learning and we hope that you guys can still pay attention to the presentation. But before we start the presentation, we would like to introduce ourselves one by one, starting from me. Hello, everyone. My name is Zefa Aprilia Yusefi. And the next one is Asmi. Hello, everyone. My name is Asmi Adhanur Hanifa. Hi, everyone. My name is Virgi. Okay. Uh, uh, we are going to start yeah. the presentation starting from Virgi Ansa. Uh, wow, our kidney control water balance, sodium balance, and potassium. Okay, before we continue the dialogue, we are going to explain briefly about the kidney, about the function of kidneys. The first one is to remove waste products from the body, and then the second one is to balance the body's fluid. Okay, and the third one is remove drugs from the body, and the fourth one is release hormone that regulate blood pressure. Uh, the fifth one is to produce an active form of vitamin D that promotes strong and healthy bones. And the last one is control the production of the red blood cell. The next slide, uh, continuing the dialogue. That is not all, uh, Virgi. Our kidneys are also critical for maintaining acid-base balance in our extracellular fluid. Hmm. I thought our lungs will remove all the carbonic acid produced by our body metabolism each day. Oh uh, yeah, that is also true. But the non-carbonic acid produced daily in our body can only be removed by our kidneys because they are not in the form of gas. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. So that explains why patients with renal failure often have problems with acidosis of their blood. Okay. Now from the dialogue, we now have three keywords. The first keyword is about acid-base balance, which is going to be explained by Firdiansa. Oh, okay. Thank you, Zepa. So the acid-base balance is a state of equilibrium acidity and alkalinity of the body fluid. An acid is a substance that is capable of giving up a hydrogen ion during a chemical exchange, and a base is a, sub is a substance that can accept it. The positively charged ion is the active constituent of all acid. So acid-base balance is a one of uh, homeostatic regulation, and this is the correlation with the kidney. So the kidney acts as the regulator by absorbing the carbonate when it needs to control acid. In it when there is a deficit of the acid in the body. The kidney also facilitates the extraction of excess hydrogen ion in combination with phosphate ion or in combination with ammonia. Thank you, Zip. Okay, 
okay thank you so much for your g okay the next keyword the second keyword is about non carbonic acid which is going to be explained by me uh, so what is this non carbonic acid non carbonic acid or also known as non volatile acid is an acid that is produced by our body from sources other than carbon dioxide for example acetoacetic acid lactic acid beta hydroxybutyrate acid derived from sulfur containing amino acids and also phosphorus containing compounds uh, as for uh, next slide as me Okay, I will explain the last keyword. Uh, this is about renal failure that often with acidosis. In patients with renal failure is simple like chronic kidney disease, CKD, the causes of metabolic acidosis include one, impair ammonia excretion, two, decrease tubular reabsorption of bicarbonate and insufficient production of bicarbonate in relation to the amount of acid synthesized in the body and in as with the food. Okay, okay Zefa. Just like what I have already explained before, uh, from this slide we can see that our the acids in our body are divided into two, the volatile acid and then the non-volatile acid. As for the non-volatile acid, I'm going to be the one who explained it. Okay, the protein of metabolism in our body generates the, no, the non-volatile acid, which are buffered by both intracellular and, and extracellular buffers, including biocarbonate, which get used up in the daily buffering of non-volatile acid. And then they are going to be regenerated by the kidneys. Uh, as for the volatile acid, as me. Okay, thank you, Zefa. Uh, I would like to explain about a bit about volatile acid, that the concentration of hydrogen ion in the extracellular fluid is kept constant at 40 nanomole per liter. So volatile acid forms because the carbon dioxide there is produced, produced by cellular respiration and combines with water. So will forms the acid that bicarbonate and then the pulmonary alveolar ventilation will eliminate carbon dioxide from the body and prevents the accumulation of roughly like uh, 15,000 millimoles of carbonic acid that produce daily. Okay, so this is about the respiratory acidosis. There is acute and chronic and this is about the metabolic acidosis. There's metabolic acidosis non-anion gap and metabolic acidosis increase anion gap. So that's all from me. Uh, I will give it back to Zefa to give the step, uh, causing statement. Thank you. Okay, that's it from our group. Thank you guys so much for each of your attention. And if you guys want to know more about this topic, then you guys should listen carefully to Professor Cheng's explanation. And maybe you guys can write down all the important things because uh, next week we are going, we also going to learn about this topic. So it is maybe very useful for, for me. For you? Um, for all of us. Okay, that's it from uh, the last group. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Zeba, Asmi, and Hujansa for that uh, uh, overview of acid base balance. So let me finish this talk with just a few slides uh, to summarize uh, some of the information that was already shared. So let me go back. Okay, this is uh, uh, integrated diagram of uh, acid base balance. So as mentioned by the students, you the, the daily acid load to the body is mainly in the form of carbonic acid. So as long as your lungs are normal, the carbonic acid load uh, will be removed. Okay, so most of your acid load is in the form of carbonic acid, but there is a much smaller fraction of what is known as non-carbonic acid. And this small fraction, although it's very small compared to carbonic acid, can only be removed by the kidney. That is why whenever you have kidney problem, this non-carbonic acid tends to accumulate 
and you have problem with uh, metabolic acidosis. So in the response of the body to pH changes, the first, the, you could say the first front line, the front liners, the first responders are your chemical buffers. Okay, and then the respiratory system also is involved in getting rid of carbonic acid accumulation. And then the third responder, uh, which is the kidney function, is slower to respond but very effective in maintaining pH balance. Now shown here is that the kidney does two major things in order to respond to pH changes. One, it is able to reabsorb the major base, which is bicarbonate in the extracellular fluid. Not only it is it is it able to reabsorb most of the bicarbonate, which is filtered, but it is also able to synthesize and produce new bicarbonate in the nephron in order to uh, top up or, com or compensate for bicarbonate that has been used up in the acid base buffering. Okay? And then the next thing that the kidney does is that it is able to secrete and excrete the excess proton or hydrogen ion and mainly in the form of ammonium. Okay? The hydrogen ion is bound to the ammonium ion here and that is excreted in the urine. The other major urinary buffer that that is part of increased excretion of proton is the urinary phosphate buffer, not shown here. Okay, so this is basically an integrated picture. So I want to uh, just finish off with uh, one important slide to help you to appreciate how the lungs and the kidney are the two major organs that together with the chemical buffers respond to acid base balance. So this is one of my favorite picture. And this is pH is related to kidney function over lung function. Now this is because the major chemical buffer in the extracellular fluid is your bicarbonate carbonic acid chemical buffer. And this bicarbonate carbonic acid bu chemical buffer is linked or coupled to two major organ system that is able to regulate the bicarbonate factor as well as the carbonic acid factor related to the partial pressure of CO2 in the arterial blood. Okay? So, uh, so for example, if you have problems with uh, the lung, this will accumulate and you will get an increased carbonic acid and the pH will be lower. So in order to compensate for the decrease in pH, when you have respiratory acidosis, what will happen is that the, the kidney will now increase the reabsorption as well as the synthesis of bicarbonate as well as the secretion of proton. Okay? So this ratio is important in order to maintain normal pH. So keep this uh, picture in mind. Uh, this is the, the renal and the respiratory integrated control of acid base balance. As you think about the various categories of acid base disturbance and the compensation that is required. Okay. So my last two slides is uh, don't lose your homeostatic balance. The kidney is very essential in the homeostasis of the ECF. And this is uh, just a title of one of my book to say that if you want to understand physiology well, you have to think through physiology. Okay, uh, you cannot just memorize the facts, but think through, understand, and appreciate the beauty and the design in the in the wisdom of the body, as Walter Cannon said, how the kidney and other organs respond to changes. And I leave you with another song. Uh, this is with this is using lyrics from. Um, Endocrine physiology, and this is a song I think everybody knows. It's uh, you, you raise me up. Okay, so here you are. Uh, you can uh, sing this at your own leisure. Okay, so I will send you the PowerPoint slide, as I said, to Dr. Nisa, and she will uh, be able to distribute to all of you. Right, thank you very much for listening. Back to you, Dr. Nisa.
fluid, fluid balance, sodium balance, potassium balance, and acid base balance. And that, that's the important point of renal function in human body. Okay, Prof, thank you so much for your time, for your knowledge, for your sharing. I think it's very useful for us, including me, not only for children, student, student, and we hope the, there will be many next time to sharing more than what you're sharing for today. Okay, student, I give thanks so much for all students who have attended the lecture in this room and for all students who have attended the class in the online. And maybe that's our lecture for today about renal physiology. And I hope it will contribute and make being inspiration to get better and and curious and curious about renal physiology other aspect okay thank you prof thank you thank student, you and thank, Lisa, you for all and attendance. thank you students for uh, i'm sorry if i make mistake yeah please please forgive me wabil hai taufik wal hidayah wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh good afternoon prof cheng thank you okay. so much right. see you next bye. time bye bye keep in touch bye bye see ya. Yeah. Thank you all. Bye bye. Yeah. Uh, maybe we will, we could take capture Prof. Yeah, we can. Capture yeah. First. Okay. Please okay. do that. Dafa or Gatra could take capture for our documentary. Maybe you could make all attendance model, and maybe Mr. Herman could help us. Okay. Okay. Dafa. Maybe all of you could make the other slide the other slide slide one slide two slide three sort four sort five okay come on Mumble. Thank you so much, student. Thank you for attending this lecture. I hope it will, it will be inspired you all. It will be inspired. It, it will inspire you to. It will be inspiring you to be curious with anything about physiology more and more. Okay. Thank you. Maybe that's enough for today. See ya. Bye. Give spirit. Happy learning. <laughs>